Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm quite excited uh, being invited to such uh, an exciting conference indeed. And I, um, well, there was a lot of input already. I hope I can add someone, uh, something to, to that. So, um, what's the subject today? It's um, the question of uh, the relevance of central bank digital currency in the context of Bitcoin. And I start with a headline of the 3rd of January 2009. Um, from the Times, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. I don't know if uh, some of you know this headline, because it's encrypted in the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain, and was written by Satoshi Nakamoto into, into this uh, Genesis block, which was obviously a big signal to, to, to the people uh, that he uh, did not choose very accidentally, but he chose it at a, as a kind of attack on the current banking system, which was already under attack, indeed, in this, uh, during this time. So, attack on the banking system, as well as on, as implication on the central bank money. Um, now, many central banks have reacted, in a way, to the emergence of Bitcoin and of cryptocurrencies, they did a lot of research and are doing still a lot of research um, in crypto, in, in not, not really in cryptocurrencies, but in central bank digital currency, which is indeed a different thing. They are actively exploring into it. This list is not complete. There you can add uh, quite a, another dozen to it. Um, and it shows, okay, there is something happening over there and um, people are... Uh, at the central banks are aware that something is happening with the payment system and also with the monetary system. Now, before going deeper into the question why central banks are bothered, concerned about um, um, central bank digital currency and what is the motivation behind thinking harder about central bank digital currency, Let's go more into detail what forms of money actually exist. And a good approach to do that is to go into the so-called money flower, which has been um, well invented in a way by authors of the Bank of International Settlement. And it's a quite good way to, to localize where cash is located, where central bank digital currency is located, where... Um, um, Bitcoin is also located. So let's start uh, in explaining this, this money flower. For example, if you take um, this ellipse, the green one. The green one includes all kind of money which has been issued by the central bank. All money which is not issued by the central bank is outside this green ellipse. The same is true for the blue ellipse. All kind of money which takes a digital form is included in this ellipse. All kind of money which is not digital, so it's physical, not digital, is outside this ellipse. And the same is true for um, the characteristic of being widely accessible, all included in the, in the red one. If it's not widely accessible, it's outside. Or token-based, inside, outside is account-based. So, if you take these four characteristics um, for money, then you get to four kinds of central bank digital currencies. Um, the most well known in banking, banking is this kind of central bank digital currency, which already exists. It's not widely accessible, only, but it's digital. It's central bank issued, obviously, and it's not token-based, so it's account-based. That's um, the, well, actually, it's the central bank accounts which banks hold at the central bank. This central bank digital currency already exists. What does not exist is central bank account for general purpose, so widely accessible. This is this one. This does not exist already, but it can exist. It can be built up. 
and um, so central bank accounts with general purpose are widely accessible, they are digital, and they are central bank issued. Okay, where is cash? Cash is here. Cash is token-based, it's not digital, but it's central bank issued. So cash is indeed central bank money. Um, where are bank deposits? They are outside the central bank issued money because banks are generating this money, not the central bank. Um, and it's digital in form and widely accessible. And where is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is digital, is widely accessible, is token-based, but obviously is not central bank issued. So it's outside the central bank um, uh, system. Okay, so let's go back into the question, uh, to the question, why are central banks thinking about um, digital forms of central bank money. Now, the Bank of International Settlement, they thought also hard about it, and they thought, okay, let's ask the uh, central banks. So they asked, indeed, uh, 33 central banks. And what is quite um, interesting, that between advanced economies and emerging market economies, the priorities are quite different. So if you look at it, emerging market economies, they are quietly concerned about payment efficiency and financial inclusion, given the fact that, for example, in many countries, around only 40% of people have access to a banking account, 60% have not. While financial inclusion is not a big issue in advanced economies, it's uh, the lowest priority when they think about a central bank digital currency. Okay, there are other motives. I will not go deeper into it, but there is one thing which concerns quite a lot of central banks, which is the dwindling use of cash. Sweden is one big example where in the year 2018, only 13 out of 100 people have made their latest payments with cash. The other payments were all done electronically. And this trend, which is going downward quite significantly in Sweden, but if you look at the global development in China, Japan, Australia, Singapore. Um, it's a slightly other measure, but the trend is also there that um, the use of cash in relative terms is going down. So what could we expect? Well, Sweden is really thinking hard that maybe there comes a day when the whole society is cashless, so where no cash does exist anymore. And you may say, okay, it's fine. So we have a cashless society. It's very modern, very, very efficient. Why bother? Why be being concerned about it? Well, the point is that if you rely fully on non-cash, so on, on electronic payment, then you rely fully on the banking system because cash is the only way you can hold central bank money. And... This means in terms of payments and in, ter in terms of storing your money, if you don't ca cannot hold cash anymore because the society is cashless, then you rely in terms of payment and in terms of storage fully on the central bank on, on the banking sector because every payment is going through the bank the central bank banking uh, system. Now, this um, is fine as long as the banking system works. Nobody would complain about it. However, we know from 2015 from Greece, we know from 2012 in Cyprus, we know from 2001 in Argentina, well, Indonesia, Turkey, Ukraine, you name it, there are plenty of examples where the banking system went down, the payment system was disrupted, and the whole economy was hit quite hard. So, a way to to avoid this or to make the, the system more resilient would be to, well, add a new payment system in a way where every citizen gets a central bank account. So in today's world, it's looking like this. So if you have an um, account holder A, he has a banking account at A, at bank A, let's say, and if he wants to make a transfer to bank 
uh, account holder B, then he must go through the banking system and through the central bank system. What you can do to shorten it and to, well, circumvent the banking sector, to, um, you can do it like this. So account holder A has a central bank account at the central bank, and the account holder B has also a uh, central bank account at, uh, at the central bank. And so um, you don't need the banking sector in this respect, um, which could be good in the case that a banking crisis hit the economy. So it does not mean that necessarily the banking system does not play any, must not play any role in the, bank, in the payment system. But it means that if there is a banking crisis, the whole system would be more resilient because you have still a redundant double payment system and could rely on it so that the heart of the economy, which is the payment system in a way, is not um, destroyed fully. Now, this is one way to think about central bank digital currency, to think about it in terms of, okay, everybody holds a central bank account. This would be the equivalent of central bank digital currency. And Sweden, for example, is thinking in this way about um, this entertainment, even though they say, well, we are not at the state where we will, uh, will really introduce it. Um, now, the other question is if um, a blockchain approach makes sense um, for central banks to, when, when they think about central bank digital currency. Does it make sense uh, to go away from a central bank account or to, to structure the central bank account in a blockchain way? Now, let me skip this. Um, there are a few trade-offs in the blockchain system, which um, I will go into it. So, if you think about um, the left hand, which is the most radical solution, which is obviously Bitcoin, a public decentralized blockchain. Um, this is obviously not an alternative for the central bank because it would be contradictive. Bitcoin is outside the central bank system, so it does not make sense to think about it as a central bank issued money. However, there are, if you go to the right, many possibilities of structuring a blockchain. First, it should be permissioned if you want, as a central bank, manage this blockchain. And it could be partly or fully centralized. Well, the, the big advantage of a centralized blockchain, where you have a, a big, big server and or a cloud, if you would like so, um, is that in terms of speed and storage capacity, you get the maximum. So uh, Amazon um, Web Service, they have a big, big server or various big servers, but, but they have the capacity to, to offer really high speed and high storage. Now, on a, if you go way back and decentralize the thing and have, let's say, 1,000 or 10,000 nodes um, which are actually acting in this blockchain, then it would be much more difficult to get the speed and, and, the, um, and the storage capacity. Well, the trade-off between speed and storage capacity is the immutability of data. If you have all concentrated in, all, in one blockchain, in one central cloud, then obviously it's more vulnerable to uh, manipulation or uh, destruction of data. So, on the, um, however, on the, on, the other si on, the, on the other side, if you um, have a more decentralized system, then obviously the data are more secure because you have so many copies of the data of the transactions that you made on the payment system. So if one um, copy or one blockchain is destroyed, you have all the others that still do work. Um, now, and that's uh, one thing that... Um, a few central banks um, uh, from the Caribbean states have thought about. I thought, okay, we have a payment system which runs in our uh, island system, let's say, and these islands are quite vulnerable towards weather conditions. So if a hurricane hits 
one island, then um, the payment system could run out of control or could run down, could, uh, could come down, and um, there would be a disruption. How could we encounter it? Well, we could encounter it with a, a blockchain system where there are various copies, and if one system goes down, then the other systems still run. Um, so for such an event, it could make uh, sense to think about a blockchain-based central bank digital currency. Otherwise, I would say there is quite a consensus um, amongst most people who um, do, are doing research in central banks that the blockchain system has not yet um, very strong advantages in comparison to the system that we have today. Um, so in, ki in terms of speed, in terms of storage capacity, it's not a system that runs much better or even it does not mu uh, run better than the current system. Um, so there are some central banks who did research in terms of having a blockchain, a centralized blockchain, for example, the Central Bank of South Africa has done so, um, but they did not take the consequence, okay, we will switch to this one. It could make sense because perhaps the payments are more transparent, you can go better into history and so on. This may be, may be an issue, but um, there is no convincing uh, argument for it until now. And so um, what I believe and... Um, I will skip this. So, oh, okay, I, I can go into this because I have to, still a few minutes. So, the idea of, of the blockchain um, system um, that um, the Caribbean islands have thought about, it is, okay, if one is destroyed, we have all these copies, and so we uh, do not have to worry too much about it, or if one blockchain is manipulated, then um, it would disappear and would not be considered anymore, but the payment system as a whole would still work because we have all these blockchains, which each one has the same copies of the transactions. Now, I think it's, it's uh, right now time to, to make the conclusions. So I think that uh, central bank digital currency will remain a, a hot topic for central banks, especially for emerging economies. I have the feeling that there, the interest for it is, is much bigger, especially with uh, respect to the, um, the argument of financial inclusion. Um, payment efficiency is also playing quite a role. Bitcoin, obviously, is not an alternative for the central bank, because it's outside the central bank sphere. Um, but in terms of, of, um, of resilience of a blockchain-based system, it could be an inspiration. Uh, small countries, I named the, uh, the Caribbean states, uh, with vulnerable payment system there, it could make sense to think about a blockchain-based central bank digital currency. However, I think that bigger and more advanced countries, um, they will or stick to the old system, um, so where banks still play a key role, especially if um, the banking sector has a good track record and has not failed in the past, in the, in the nearer past, or they may introduce a central bank digital uh, currency system on a retail basis so that every citizen has a central bank uh, digital currency account. Um, so with a, with a consequence that there would be an additional payment system, which would make the uh, economy more resilient against shocks. And uh, finally, I think it's important to, to say that, that uh, the introduction of central bank digital currency should happen quite in a cautious way, because um, the design, there are plenty of, of design possibilities, and it depends very much on the design, how stable the system at the, at the end is. And so um, it's, it's quite good to make pilot projects and so on, like central banks are doing at the moment, or many are doing at the moment. But I think at the same time that uh, they should be, have an open mind toward um, changes 
which uh, could be disruptive. However, at the same time, they could be well for increasing. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss with, with you.